Okay, so um, again, welcome to our Planting for Pollinators program. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Bob Bruner. I am the a &R Extension Educator for Clay and Owen Counties in Indiana. Um, a lot of you have been attending my programs for the last year, and thank you for that. And for those of you who have been here before, you know I love talking about plants and I love talking about bugs. So when I started thinking about how to do a Planting for Pollinators program, I realized that if I talked about plants you could put in the ground, I would be talking about them all night. Um, and that wouldn't really be that conducive to getting a good solid program in that's been in the kind of half hour, 45 minute time frame that we've always been using here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna talk a little bit about how insects act around plants. How do they actually locate plants that they use for pollination and how they function when they do so. And then after that, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about a few plants and I'm gonna show you a publication that has a lot of information on the different plants that you can plant that are native and that you can generally get fairly easy access to. So first, let's just jump into the insect portion of this. We have this great picture of this lovely honeybee here. Let's talk a little bit about what this honeybee does. So when it comes to pollinators, they are critical to everything, just about everything that grows. Um, a lot of the agricultural industry would completely collapse without the help of pollinators. Um, there have been instances where some agricultural industries actually had to be helped by the presence of pollinators intentionally brought in. Uh, many of you who are beekeepers are aware that often honeybees get shipped across country to assist different um, nut industries and other industries out west. Um, the unfortunate aspect of our pollinators, and this is one that we often don't consider, is that many of them are actually pests when they're in their immature state. We love looking at butterflies, but the problem with butterflies is that every single one of them is a pest species when we find them in our garden. The, um, the reason for this is, and that third point you see there, is because all of our pollinators have distinct adult and immature forms. They have complete metamorphosis, which means they're gonna start life out uh, after they hatch from an egg as some kind of caterpillar or grub. And eventually they're going to uh, um, go through a process called ecdysis and hatch out into their adult form. There are a few exceptions to that, um, but for the most part, this is gonna remain true. So I'm gonna go through this bit by bit here with the different pollinator groups. And I'm going to tell you about them the way an entomologist looks at them. So I am an entomologist myself, and one of the things that we entomologists do is we love classifying things, and we love organizing our insects by a classification called the order. Order is a part of that scheme that you probably heard about when you were in high school, and you maybe learned a mnemonic that went King, uh, King George loves something something. Um, basically, kingdom, phylum, class, order, etc. This is that order level. The reason we group them together like this is because all insects in the same order have the same traits. They have a particular thing that matches them to each other. In the case of our butterflies and moss, Lepidoptera, their wings have scales. That's what that name means, scale wing. And these are perhaps some of our favorite pollinators. I'm showing you guys perhaps our most favorite pollinator right now, the monarch butterfly. Um, we actually recently did a program on this that you guys can feel free to look at on our YouTube channel. But what I really want to get across here is that these are an incredibly important species because they act as a great inspiration and they're also a great indicator of conditions. Now butterflies have all sorts of members within their groups and they all represent both a problem and a benefit. The clear wing moth I'm showing you right now is a great example of that. So the clear wing moth is a great pollinator. It'll go around to all different kinds of flowers and just do its business. You can see it feeding on a flower, reaching its mouth parts into the nectar well and that flower right there. It also has a neat trick to it. That butterfly is yellow and black. So what it's doing is it's practicing something called Batesian mimicry, where it's pretending to be something much more dangerous than it actually is. Um, you've probably seen a lot of clear wing moths before. But unfortunately, most of the ways that you've seen them, you have hated. The clear wing moth is also the squash vine borer. That's its immature form. The adult will lay eggs on squash, the larva will hatch and then burrow into the squash stem and vines and will consume the vascular system of the squash plant. 
So while we're deriving a great benefit from it as a pollinator, I imagine more than one person here has probably torn their hair out trying to get rid of squash vine borer out of their gardens. And that's just one example of sometimes the difficult choices that we have to make when we want to preserve our pollinators. The sphinx moth is another great uh, representative that does very similar things. This is one of our bigger moths here in Indiana, and you'll find this in the surrounding states and probably across the country as well. It's got really noticeable colors on it. It's got great patterns. Um, you'll see these fly towards lights at night, and you'll think they're nearly the size of a bat sometimes. Um, but unfortunately, the sphinx moth is actually the tomato hornworm. And we all who have grown tomatoes have gotten used to this thing. Uh, a lot of us hate it. It's, uh, it's not nearly as nasty a pet as we treat it, but it is still a problem. But the adult is an effective pollinator. So this all kind of comes together in telling you about what the larvae of pollinators do. Now, like I said, there are exceptions. Some larvae are predatory, though not within Lepidoptera, um, but all Lepidoptera and lar larvae all have chewing mouth parts, which they use to feed on plant materials. They will go after leaves, they will go after fruit, and these guys represent some of the biggest pests we have in gardens and in agriculture. So the choice that you have to make when wanting to plant and preserve pollinators is what also are you willing to sacrifice? Um, you have to be willing to accept that some of these pollinators are going to start developing within your gardens. And unfortunately, there is no good answer there. Um, that's just something that we have to learn to live with and be prepared to accept because we are going to be encouraging their presence by changing our planting habits. So on to something that's a little bit more positive. Let's go over our bees and wasps. This is a group known as Hymenoptera, which means membranous wing. Um, we are all familiar with this group. Our European honeybees are a part of this group, along with several other species that we want to do a lot of work to protect. Now, one of the things about Hymenoptera is there is a very, very common development of social behavior in these insects. So that means that when you plant for pollinators, um, for example, our European honeybee, if they find an adequate food source in say your sage or your lavender or your clover, they're going to preferentially go after that food source if there's nothing else nearby or if they just get started on it and find that it works. And then they're gonna teach all of their fellow hive mates that that's a usable food source. However, there are a lot of solitary species present within bees and wasps. And these are things that we often forget about. I'm going to go over a few of our solitary bee species in a moment. Now, the thing that people often confuse when it comes to our hymenopterans is that we all think that they're all terrific pollinators. Well, this actually isn't that true. And that also holds true for our lepidoptera, our butterflies and moths. Some of them are better at pollinating than others. Just because you see a bee doesn't necessarily mean it's doing a great job pollinating. Or, and if you're trying to do some pollinating for say an orchard or something like that, sometimes they can actually represent a problem because they'll sometimes cross pollinate things that you don't want to hybridize. So let's dive in a little bit here to our European honeybee. Now the European honeybee is a really complex insect. It has this great socialization. They are able to communicate all kinds of information to their fellow hive mates. Um, they actually have developed a form of language that they can share with members of their hive that is so clear that entomologists have actually been able to decode that language. So basically, when a bee goes to the hive, it'll perform a bee dance where it tells a hive mate where to locate food. We've actually managed to decode that dance almost in its entirety. We can actually look at it and say, okay, that bee has found a food source this far away, judging by this position of the sun. That's incredible for an insect, for something that has a brain that isn't that complex. Uh, European honeybees are great in the fact that they're hardworking and they produce a commodity for us. Every single county in Indiana has beekeepers. Both of my counties do, and most likely some of the people here in this program tonight are beekeepers themselves. There are hives maintained throughout the state, and you can go to individual farms who will sell all kinds of different products um, just within driving range of where I'm sitting right now, there are four that I'm aware of. So you can find these all over Indiana, and it's a big part of our industry in this state. Now, let's look at this bee. 
This bee is known as a mason bee. And you can see that this one looks a little bit different. He's a little bit darker. And you can see that he's got a lot of hair covering his body. Now this bee is one of our solitary bees. It rarely stings, so this means that he stays alone. Um, and when it says rarely stings right there, I'm very serious about that. You really have to mess with these guys to get them to sting you. They just want to run. Now, while the mason bee is great at pollinating, it's one of our problem bees if you are someone who's trying to maintain like an orchard, because these guys will actively cross pollinate. However, now that I've said that, what I also want to add to it is that if you're just planting to try to get pollinators present, if you're just trying to support our native bee populations, this guy is great because that means you can plant all kinds of things. He's a generalist. He doesn't care. He will go for everything. And that's a great trait in an insect for that. These guys are also good for our small fruit pollination, so long as that hybridization isn't a problem to you. Um, so this is one of our natives. This is one of the ones that we really want to protect in Indiana. Another great bee that we all grew up with, the bumblebee. These guys are perhaps one of the cutest bees, as everyone tells me. They love seeing bumblebees. There are several bumblebee species that are up right now. Um, I saw a mating pair earlier as I was leaving my office um, just earlier today, right outside the door by our flowers. So bumblebees are social. They, most of them are. However, they do have a problem. They have a trait where they can be brood parasitic. And what that means is that they will lay their eggs in another bee's brood and force that bee to raise their young. So that way they're not putting in energy, in, but they're deriving all the benefit from that bee's work. This is also another insect that it can sting, but they generally don't. Um, you can hold a bumblebee in your hand and nine times out of 10, it won't sting you. And one thing I should add to this is that our mason bees and our bumblebees, while they can sting, not all of them will lose their stinger. Most of them will actually keep their stinger. Our European honeybee will, keep the, will lose the stinger and they'll die, but some of these bees, they just won't. They'll be able to do it again. And of course, one thing that I want to point out with our bumblebee is that we are seeing a decline due to human activity. Unfortunately, they are sensitive to what we do because we fragment our habitat. We use pesticides that uh, around sensitive areas where they're going to be present. So they're suffering for that. And part of what I'm hoping you get out of this program tonight is uh, new ways to try to help protect them and help give them safe places where they can exist. Okay, so I'm gonna throw you guys a question and I want you to just answer in the chat for me. Look at this picture and I wanna see who here thinks that this is a bee. And go ahead and answer me in the chat. I'll give you guys just a couple of minutes. All right, so just looking at what's going by on the chat right now, you guys are on top of this. Um, you have probably been to one of my programs before or you've already done your research. You are very correct. This is a fly. This is what is known as a hover hoverfly. Um, it is not a robber fly. It's not in the same family. This is in a group known as Cirphidae. Um, it is one of our pollinators. It again is practicing a form of mimicry known as Batesian mimicry, where it's trying to look like something far more dangerous than it actually is. However, they are very harmless. Now, what I want you guys to understand, the reason I put this image in here is not only is it a pollinator, but we have a colloquial name for this insect here in Indiana. Who here grew up wanting to avoid getting stung by sweat bees? I bet a lot of you did. I know I did. This is what we would often refer to as a sweat bee. Now I can safely tell you this insect does not have a stinger. Um, it doesn't even have mouth parts capable of biting. It is completely harmless. It is just a mimic. So please, when you see these guys come out and they start hovering around you, uh, and there are some coming out right now, I just saw them this week, please don't kill them. Just bat them away. They are pollinators and they are gonna help you out. 
So I kind of went over this, but one thing that I should point out too is that these guys are all are very efficient pollinators. They are great in agricultural fields um, and they can help pollinate your garden. They're actually quite good at it. Um, one thing that I will note on here and I added it in the slide is they are often attracted to the putrid flowers. So flowers uh, like corpse flowers and things that have putrescine, or, um, the ones that smell really terrible. But if you want to really help, you can buy some of those and plant them and you will attract um, hoverflies who are a part of a order there I should mention called diptera, which means two wing. Um, I see someone's asking, do hoverflies live in Michigan? Uh, yes, definitely. You will see hoverflies pretty much nationwide. Um, there are several different species and they'll have different names, sometimes called flower flies or corn flies but you'll find them in a lot of areas across the United States. Uh, less so in the more mountainous areas, I would imagine, but they're definitely out there. Okay, so something else. This is one thing that I always try to do when I talk about hoverflies is one of the things that um, people ask me is how do I tell the difference between a hoverfly and something that I don't want, like a wasp? So let's break this down. Some of you have already noticed the differences. So one thing that a lot of people teach you is a hoverfly can be told from a wasp by the number of wings. Hoverflies only have two wings because they're a fly. A wasp has four. Now folks, I'm an entomologist. I've been one for a long time and I can tell you, I am not gonna take the time to count the wings if I am sure, not sure that something is a wasp or not. There's something a little bit easier you can do. Look at the eyes on the two insects. One of you already pointed out, the eyes look like a fly. They have extremely large eyes. That's most of their head capsule. Whereas the wasp has very thin eyes. They're very aerodynamic looking. I can see that during flight and I have terrible vision. So most of you will probably be able to see that. Something else I point out too, is that hoverflies hover. They will hover in the air directly in front of you and they'll stay there. Wasps don't really hover very well. They can do it for short amounts of time, but they're generally going to just try to keep uh, zooming by. They're kind of like sharks. They tend to keep moving. The other thing you'll note is that a hoverfly, when it lands on you, will wiggle its abdomen up and down threateningly as though it's gonna sting you. Folks, if a wasp like a yellow jacket lands on you, it's not gonna threaten you. It's just gonna sting you and then all of its buddies are gonna come and sting you. So use these to help learn what are the hoverflies around you. And just remember, they are not harmful. They will not do anything to you and they're actually helping you out. Okay, so for the next thing that I wanted to talk about, I just covered some of our pollinators. Now I wanna cover how do our pollinators actually locate the flowers they need to be able to survive. Part of that is through vision. Now look closely at this image. What you're looking at is a close-up of the eye of a bee. Um, you'll note here that the eye of the bee is very faceted. So the external portions of insects are composed of a material called chitin. It's extremely tough and extremely strong. It's not very digestible by most animals and it makes great armor. Their eyes are also composed of that same material. But the trouble is, is that if your eye is entirely composed of a non-moving material that's extremely strong, you're not gonna be able to see very easily through it. So insects have unique eyes. You can even see that they have sensory hairs coming out of their eyes, so that way they can actually detect the environment like touch and wind. So this is just a little bit of a breakdown of the facet on, in that insect's eye. And it's not all that different from ours. They have a cornea like our eyes do that focuses light through that crystalline cone that's labeled there. And it's pushing that light through a sensory cell called a rhabdome. Um, and this all is all composed of an organ known as an omatidium. What this really results in is that the insect is detecting light it's probably not detecting a whole lot of variation in light, but one important factor is that the insect is able to see a form of light we can't. Namely, they can see into the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. So let's just do a quick comparison. So the image on top, we can see due to having more complex eyes and a brain that's capable of abstraction, we can see that there is a circle and a square through that grid pattern right there. 
However, the, the bottom half of the image is what an insect would see. The circle and the square would translate basically into the same image. They can't abstract out what they're looking at, and they can't get the amount of detail that you or I can through their eyes. So let's look at this in a different way. I'm showing you an image right now that's through that kind of lensing that an insect might have. What are you guys looking at? Someone put in the chat what we're looking at right now. Yeah, exactly. We're looking at a flower garden. We know that because we can see the colors and the shapes of the objects there, and our brains can extrapolate that information through our and use our experience to tell us this is a flower garden. However, an insect would look at this, they may not see all the colors there. They definitely won't get any of the definition. So they may not be able to tell what they're looking at. It's all just going to be kind of an interesting smear of colors to them if they can see that many. What about this image right here? What do you guys think this image is? Go ahead and throw it in the chat for me. Yeah, this one's a little harder, isn't it? Yeah, Google Earth from far away. That's a good answer. Um, this one, I believe, is a flowering tree branch. So yeah, one of you got it right. I believe that this is a flowering tree branch. I think this is actually a cherry tree. Um, but again, that was hard for us to get through. So now we have to assume that the insect, if it was hard for us to extrapolate what this was, the insect is going to be having a major challenge when they're trying to locate their food. But the insect has one advantage that we don't. They can see into ultraviolet. So how does that influence what they're doing? Well, let's take this lovely set of orchids here. Have you ever asked yourself why flowers have the different colors they do or the different shapes? To us, we see a gorgeous looking orchid. However, an insect may see something different. When an insect approaches that, they see a shape that reminds them of another insect. In fact, this particular orchid, what it's attempting to do is it's attempting to mimic a uh, species of insect that is the opposite sex of the insect that's trying to find it. It's trying to attract a mate, thereby attract a pollinator to it. And it's got another advantage. Let's take this image. The one on the left is what you or I may see, bright yellow flowers against the green background of leaves. But the image on the right, this is what the insect will see. Now that blue, black, blue background there, this is what an insect sees flying everywhere. Just a whole bunch of green mess. And this is just kind of a different color pattern for frame of reference. This is not exactly what they see. But the flowers stick out to them. The flowers have different colors under the effects of UV light. Where they're white on the edges, they now have a red center. Do you think an insect may notice that more? It's definitely going to stand out amongst all the green or other colors that they see. How about this? Look at this flower under different light spectrums. The top left image is showing what it looks like to us. The other images are under UV light and colored to give us a frame of reference. If you think about it, what is that going to look, look like from the point of view of an insect? What do you guys think? Someone give me an idea. What does that look like to an insect? That is exactly right. You nailed it in one. That is a target. Yeah, pathway to nectar, exactly. What it is is that flower is putting out a landing pad just like a helicopter pad. It's sending out a visual signal to the insects that says, land here, there's food. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the plants that are getting pollinated by our pollinators have evolved in conjunction with them. They began to favor traits that would attract more insects, so they began to breed for those traits. And insects began to uh, favor traits that were used to identify those plants. Thus, they began to see better into the UV spectrum. 
Now that's not the only way an insect is going to locate the food that it wants. It's also going to use an ex extremely sensitive sense of smell. The antenna that they have are also, that, that is essentially their chemical sensor and they're extremely good at finding their food. They can detect very small amounts of uh, plant volatile molecules from a very long distance away. All right, I threw this one in here as just a bit of an intermission with a cute little bee butt up there to kind of demonstrate that this bee was able to successfully find this great plant that it's feeding from, and that plant is deriving the benefit of getting pollinated. So let's talk a little bit about planting now. So there are a few considerations that I want you guys to think about when it comes to planting. The first thing I want you to think about is what are the native plants in your region? And this is one of those reasons why I didn't dive deep this evening into particular plants because there are lots of different regions represented by my audience here. Consider what is natively growing. You're gonna to wanna to favor that. Um, while there are some introduced plants that can act pretty well for pollinators, if we're really wanting to get our native pollinators here, you're gonna want those native plants that they have evolved in tandem with. You also wanna consider the soil type that you're working with. If you are in one of my counties, you're dealing with extremely clay-filled soil. Uh, however, if you're in the county that I live in, that has extremely sandy soils. So you're looking at differences in how well water is being held, differences in how compacted the soil is gonna get, and you're gonna to want to take that into consideration as you plan out the different native species that you wanna put in the ground. And of course, the last one, which is particularly pertinent this evening, is how much water do you get? Do you get a decent amount of rain? Are you located near a wetland or a localized water source like a, pool, a pond or a lake? Or do you get good rain amounts or very little at all? Um, just this evening, we got quite a bit of rain dumped on us just a little bit ago. However, in some areas of the country, you may not necessarily get that much rain very often or only at certain times of year. These are things that you need to consider so that way when you do your plantings, choose plants that are gonna be able to survive the environment that you put in, not only survive, but also thrive. So that way you're not doing the same thing over and over every year. And yes, that is an excellent point. How much sun versus shade are you getting as well? That is a very good point. So I threw in a few pictures of some of the natives that you might consider, and then I'm gonna move on to our um, publication. So wild bergamot's one that I see mixed into several prairie mixes and native mixes that um, produce some really nice little flowers. And they're also kind of handy because wild bergamot um, sustains itself fairly well. It doesn't need to be stratified. It can go straight into bare soil right at the start of spring. Um, one thing to consider with wild bergamot, however, is that it is a mint. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as horse mint or bee balm, but since it is a member of the mint family, it does have some rhizomal growth and it means it may spread some. It is not invasive. It's just one of those plants that if you want to, you may need to control it. However, I, I like the way it looks. I'd be happy if it spread all over my yard, but that's my personal preference. Um, another one is purple cone flower. This one is very native to Indiana, certainly. Um, we won't see this one for a little bit yet because it is a little bit later in the season. This one has a really good bloom period from mid to late summer. So we'll begin to see it pop up in June and it'll probably last almost all the way to August is what I, would, is what I normally see where I'm at. Um, this one is a partial sun plant. I have seen some do well in full sun, but I believe it is intended to be a partial sun plant. And it does require some fertile soil to it. Um, you can make it work in clay soil or drier soils, but you're going to need to baby those a little bit. So those are plants that you might consider in a portion of your yard that does fairly well. It's got good fertile loam in it, but if you've got kind of a clay area, you're probably gonna wanna put something else in there, like that wild bergamot that might survive a little bit better. And the last one I was gonna add for the slide set is our milkweed. Now, I'm gonna start this off by saying that um, a few weeks ago, Tabby Flynn from Vigo County and I did a program on bonarch butterflies and milkweed, and she has an excellent presentation on types of milkweeds. And I wanna send you guys all there to look at that because that's just a great resource that she's already developed, but I just wanted to at least mention milkweed this evening once. 
So milkweed is our host plant for our monarch butterflies. They need this. This is where they will put their young. This is where their young will feed and develop. There are several varieties that are very easy to grow here in Indiana. Um, I'm wanting to get some butterfly weed going at some point myself. And the great thing about milkweed is that they are technically a toxic plant to most herbivores. Um, that's why monarchs are particularly specialized on them. They can actually uh, control the toxin in their bodies. So it makes it so it's a plant that's going to grow, it's going to develop well, and it's definitely going to bring some monarchs to your area. Now, the only problem that uh, people often have with milkweed is that it does kind of look like a weed uh, before it blooms out. And sometimes people accidentally mow them off before they realize it, or they just think it's ugly. But uh, folks, I'm here to tell you these plants are great. They will get monarch butterflies to your yard. So please, if you want to plant something, think about planting some milkweed. All right, so I can come back to this in a moment for contact information. What I'm going to do now is I am going to switch what I'm sharing with you because I want to share with you the publication. Let's see, can you guys see that right now on my screen? All right, so I'm hearing a yes. So this is a publication done by Purdue Extension. It's labeled as POL-6, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to send this to all of you after tonight's program, once I got the recording done. This publication is great because it tells you a location where you can even buy some of these plants or where you can look for them. So all the plants listed here, you can find at grownativeindiana.org. Um, and that is a great resource to use for this. Now, one of the things that it mentions here is that if in the following columns that I'm going to show you, if ephemeral is checked, what you're looking at are plants that would have been growing now and are about to die off. There will be plants on here, though, that will be, there will be some annuals, there'll be some perennials. So let's just dive in a little bit and see what this has for us. So you can see this provides a great chart that shows you all kinds of stuff on it that makes this one of my favorite publications we've ever made. So one of the things that I as an entomologist like is that if you look over here, you could see that under the pink portion that they have here, what pollinators this is going to attract. And it's even got some extra information on this, like if it's a bee specialist or something like that. But in terms of plants, if we look at this, you could see that they have on here a wide variety of things, including several milkweeds that these are readily available. Um, you can get these from Grow Native or you can get them from different organizations like Monarch Watch. Um, and oftentimes they will send these to you for free. You can also see on here that they recommend asters, which are really great for pollinators. I personally have never grown asters myself. Um, there is a marigold on here. The marsh marigold is one suggested plant that you can try for pollinators. And looking over, this one will attract bees to it. So that is just a great addition, in my opinion. Um, going down a little bit, we have a few different plants on here, some geranium. But one thing that I am experimenting with is sunflowers. This year, I'm planting sunflowers in my yard to see if I can get some more pollinators. Um, the planting habits of these are fairly simple. That You just need to take a tick seed uh, sunflower or other types you just push the uh, seed about a half an inch into the ground and hopefully in about two to four weeks you'll see them beginning to sprout and you will get them to flower in the same year. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to address that question at the end and I'm just going to keep going over this one because I want to think about that one for a second. Um, we can see that we have some iris, some blazing star. We also have some loose strife. Now, one thing that I want to point out with loose strife is these two are natives, the fringe and the prairie loose strife. But I want you guys to keep in mind there is an invasive loose strife, the purple loose strife. Do not plant that one. That one will ruin your yard. It will ruin your day. Um, that one spreads incredibly easily. It is not native. So please avoid purple loose strife. Uh, if you want more information on that plant, I can always get it to you. We have a few publications on that and other, other uh, invasives. But one thing I also want to bring to your attention too on this publication is they included trees and shrubs, which I thought was really, really interesting because we all typically think of flowers and other things that we can plant. So if we look at our trees and shrubs, they include on here a couple of maples. They've got buckeye, serviceberry. Um, there are other plants too. 
Uh, we have here meadowsweet, steeplebush, uh, winterberries on here, persimmon, and dogwoods are on here. So for those of you who are allergy sufferers, uh, bad news for you because dogwoods I'm terribly allergic to, but they are great for attracting pollinators. One last bit that I'll share with you on this one, they actually went ahead and put some grasses and sedges in. Now grasses and sedges are typically wind pollinated. These are generally plants that insects don't visit, but there are a few that will be visited. So they're noting here, like this one is a host to a skipper, a type of butterfly. So big blue stem. Um, they got a broom grass. They've got blue joint grass. Um, they also have yellow fox sedge, which is one that is actually fairly common in my area of Indiana. If you're ever curious on how to identify it, it has a triangular stem to it. That's how you identify all of our sedges here. And they also have a little blue stem, some Indian grass, and prairie drop seed, and a few others. But I want you to note what's in these special notes on this side is that primarily these grasses, they are helping out butterfly pollinators. So they're not so much for bees. These are actually helping out our butterflies. All right, so um, I'm going to save that for now in case, and just keep remind you guys again, I am going to send that to you as soon as I get the recording done. And I'm going to go back to sharing the contact information that I have for you. All right, so there's the contact information. If you'd like to get with me to ask a few more questions on different native plantings, um, part of the reason I didn't include a whole lot of information on the individual native plantings is because, again, we have a fairly diverse audience and where you're from, and uh, there are just a lot of natives that we could plant. Uh, that would take quite a bit of time to go through all of them, and as much as I'd love to say that I'm an expert in every single one, I'm not, and I'd like to confer with experts on that one before I give you solid information but I'm more than happy to talk to you about it and help you reach out to the people who can get you the information you want for if you're thinking of something in particular. But you've got my contact information in front of you, and I've also put up a link to our Purdue Ed store that has this publication and several others when it comes to planting for pollinators or garden activities or really anything, as well as a link to our Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. They can help you identify disease problems and other issues that you may have. All right, so with that, I want to, oh yeah, um, I just want to thank you guys for coming tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.